of why I thought I should be here talking to you. And we set this up, oh, how long ago was it when you first contacted me? Maybe three, four months. About four months ago, and we had a little chat online uh, with Diego. And what evolved from that was, why don't I talk a little bit about citrus diseases, but I will spend most of my time talking about this new disease that's going to threaten California. That was the conversation three or four months ago. And it's this disease, one long being, and, uh, and as luck would have it, I wouldn't call it luck, uh, it's 10 days before I'm here to give you a presentation, it's no longer a theoretical uh, threat, it's an actual threat in the state, it's, it's here. So I guess uh, don't, don't blame me, I had nothing to do with the talk, I wasn't responsible. But uh, we now have the disease in California. So. It's a, as far as, world, as far as as the world is concerned, there's nothing new about this disease, and we'll just stress that. And lots of research has been done, lots of scientists, international scientists, have spent whole careers on this disease. And one of them is a French scientist called José Beauvais, and um, he's, he's written a very uh, major review article on this disease, and it's listed in the handout that I provided to Diego. I don't know what happened to that, but I sent Diego a uh, file with, uh, with a handout that uh, has references for you if you want them. Diego can print that out, or he can send you the PDF file. Uh, but yeah, but he has it, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Jose Bode is an absolute expert, and he, he coined this little phrase in his review article that struck me as being uh, good for a title. So, the dragon is emerging. Um, uh, it, that's so pertinent for us here in California now. The dragon is emerging. So, the name in Chinese is Huang Long Bing, and translated, that means yellow dragon disease. And that's why I've used a yellow color for the back, for the slides. So, uh, so it's yellow dragon disease in uh, China. And uh, South Africa's had it for a long time, and in China, in uh, South Africa, they call it greening, and we'll see why. So, as you know, it's now reached our North American continent, and uh, Florida's had it for a few years, and so I'll just read you a little quote. Uh, a study released earlier this year by the University of Florida's Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences estimated the disease had cost that state's industry more than $3 billion dollars in lost revenue since 2006. So that's big. So what does it look like? Well, it doesn't look good. So hey, this is China. This is a field in China uh, of, uh, of sweet orange. And so what you're looking at are small, sick plants. And you're also seeing a lot of yellow shoots here and there on the plants, which therefore gives it partly its name, the yellow shoot. Um, you're going to have poor yields, you're going to have small, low-grade fruit, and since the plants never, the, the citrus trees never now get very large before the disease kills them, uh, you suddenly find your industry planting on very close spacings. There's no point in planting on traditional spacings, the trees are never going to get that big. So you've now got high density planting because the trees are going to be so small before finally, 10 years after the disease, uh, gets to 100% completion in the grove, the grove has to go. You have to rip it out and start again. So that is it. That's, that's you know, pulling no punches. That's where you can be with this disease once it actually takes over your industry. What do they do with the soil after they pull out a bad grove? Do they just uh, leave it fallow I, for a while? Or? I don't know. The soil wouldn't have any impact on the disease per se. Since it would. It's, you know, so the classic foliage symptoms are as represented here. Uh, healthy citrus leaves, sweet orange leaves on the left, uh, very familiar to us in California. And it's the blotchy mottle that uh, betrays this disease. Yellow blotchy mottles are mottling effects uh, on the leaves. But as all of you will know, that's a very non-specific uh, disease symptom. And there's a hand raised. Yeah, does this affect all the GCA? Does it affect what? All Rutaceae. Yeah, um, many, yes, basically all Rutaceae, yes. Which we'll get back to that. <laughs> so the blotchy model on the leaves is a giveaway symptom, but it's not a giveaway symptom because it's a very non-specific kind of disease symptom. Question? You were talking about in eight or ten years having to replant the grove, the photograph we saw earlier. 
But if you retain those pictures, those, those plants for eight or 10 years, aren't you retaining a reservoir of infection yeah. that the Asian citrus psyllid can feed on yeah. and then move to other groves? Yeah. So even though the tree may not die. Well, we're going to discuss all of that. Okay, quickly, it's still a risk. So there's zinc deficiency. Um, it's not the same as the slide I've just shown you, but to a casual observer, how you can say, what is it, zinc deficiency? Well, it's not zinc deficiency because it's never all the trees all over the grove, where when it's zinc deficiency, basically all the trees tend to look the same. So the fact that it's not evenly distributed as a symptom throughout the grove will be one of the ways the extension people will be trying to make a judgment of whether we're talking about something like zinc deficiency or whether we have a, a disease that's causing blotchy leaves. And as for fruit, um, what you're seeing here are diseased fruit from diseased trees uh, and the leaves from those trees and three healthy fruit alongside. So obviously you've got small fruit, you've got fruit that have not ripened, You've got normal fruit that curl up at the styla end and work backwards to the peduncle end. It's the opposite with these. And that's why the South Africans call it greening. Because in an infected grove, if you have any color, it's on the back side. And all the front of the fruit facing you is still green. And hence the name for the disease of green, because the fruit stays green. Um, the small fruit are not only small, they're also misshapen. It's very common for them to be lopsided, as illustrated here. These being healthy, healthy fruit to the left and right, and the diseased fruit uh, in the center. And the other thing is, this is a, a seedy uh, sweet orange. The seeds abort and die. So you, you have dead brown seeds uh, in, the, in the fruit. So these are all characteristic symptoms of this disease. Uh, for a couple of years now, the U University of California have had available on their websites a spotter's guide, which you can just print out, or you can get cards like this. And it shows the symptoms we've been talking about, it describes what we've been talking about, also mentions this, this, the, the fruit will have a bit of taste, and uh, gives you a little bit of information about hot lines and so on. So UC has been quite responsive uh, in, in the past in getting prepared for this, in producing publications. And so what causes it? Well, it's a bacterium. And the bacterium cannot be grown. If, if you, any of you have got a little bit of microbiology in you, you know you plate bacteria out on a plate and it grows, and then you work from the, with the bacterium growing on an agar plate. Nobody has succeeded yet in culturing this uh, bacterium. So it lives obligately in a plant. That's where it's going to live. And where it lives in the plant is in the tubes within the plant that carry the sugar solutions up and down the plant, from the leaves to the roots and to the shoots and to the newly developing fruit. They all need a lot of sugar solution. It all flows through little pipes called the sieve tubes. And within those sieve tubes, uh, presumably because that's where the sugar is, uh, that's where these bacteria live, specifically in the plant, within the sieve tubes. And they grow and multiply there and divide and accumulate and block the sieve tubes and then that's all she wrote. You, you basically strangle the plant's uh, food system by the uh, growth of the bacterium within the tubes. Um, there was a lot of debate for a lot of years as to really what it was, whether it was a true bacterium or whether it was something else. Initially it was thought to be a virus, but it's not a virus, it's a bacterium. And because it's not being cultured, it makes it that much more difficult to uh, prove your hypotheses. But the presence of these very thick walls um, that you can see in these slides is the giveaway that it is in fact a bacterium and not any other kind of microorganism. Uh, the, 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 the disease that causes stubborn disease in California in, in citrus is a different uh, microbial organism. It is not a bacterium. So this is not, it's not in the stubborn class, it's a true bacterium. And um, this is stubborn, this is a cross-section of stubborn that does not have the thick wall uh, that the, um, the bacterium has. So the bacterium is called Candidatus. It, it's, it's actually called Li Liberobacter, and there's three different species. You don't need to be concerned, we'll get to that in a second. But if you can't culture a bacterium, you always add the word in front of it, Candidatus. That means it's a candidate bacterium because nobody's managed to culture it yet, there's still some question marks. 
So it's Candidatus liberobacter species, and there's three of them. The way we test for it is a lab-based test. It's called PCR. It's a very good test, um, but it doesn't work very well to give you positives during the two years when the plant is infected, but before it starts showing symptoms. So in that two-year window, when there aren't any symptoms yet, though the plant is already infected, we, at this point, really can't detect that that tree is infected. Once they start to show symptoms, and you've got this, this problem, I really can't tell whether it is a symptom of the disease or it's a symptom of something else like a deficiency, then the test will sort you out. Then at that stage, you can test the plant material with the lab-based methods, and they will return a positive, and um, then you'll know that it is indeed the, the disease and not some non-specific cause for the symptoms. But during those two years, even though the test won't detect it, it can still serve as a disease reservoir yes. where the citrus psyllid can pick it up and, oh gee. That's correct. Right. Um, um, right, yeah. And so, it's also possible to test the psyllids. In fact, that's how this, this, um, this, this outbreak in California was first um, found to be likely to be there. It was a, te a positive test on a psyllid. Um, but I read up on it and it's not very good. The testing in the psyllids is not very good. The titer, the concentration of the bacterium in the psyllids is never very high, regardless. And, um, and there's a problem we always have in testing the insect. Just because it's positive for the, for the bacterium doesn't mean it's ready to transmit it. In other words, if you ate an orange with this bacterium in it and we tested you, you would be positive because you have bacteria in you from the orange that you ate. That doesn't mean that it's multiplying or going to be transmitted. So a positive on a psyllid doesn't mean that much, but it tells you that it's around. It tells you the bacterium is in your um, environment. So the psyllid testing still has a lot more work to be done on it. Um, and so the distribution of this disease uh, in the world and, and the times when it started to show up in those countries is you start back in the very early 1900s or the late 1800s because it was known long before but in 1919 there was a very accurate sci scientific publication in Chinese uh, describing this uh, disease in a way that nobody would ever have to re-describe it the, the scientific publication was, was, was fully complete and so the disease was fully described in 1919 in the Chinese literature, also Taiwan, and, but even in those articles, comments, of course, were there that there's nothing new here, it's just we're now describing it, it's been around for a long time. And then in that part of the world, and spreading to Africa, it, it, Asian countries, African countries, or Oceania, South American countries, uh, at least 40 countries are all, all, all have the disease. Um, South America, Brazil was 2004, the huge Brazil citrus industry, it, it saw its first positives in 2004, uh, Florida in 2005, Mexico in 2009, uh, Texas in January of this year, we also have to add but to minor industries, Louisiana, um, Georgia and South Carolina are all positive for, for, the, uh, for the disease. Now, I think as some of you know, all of these places were positive for the insect, often decades before they were positive for the disease. The insect tends to show up before the disease does. And that, of course, describes our situation in California up until last week. We had the insect, but we didn't have the disease, but now we have both. Um, so where, where is it not in terms of citrus industries? Well, it's still not present in Australia or, a or, the, or the true Mediterranean. Um, so Spain, Italy, Israel, uh, their citrus industry still remain free. Though, of course, they're anticipating, as we anticipated, that they won't get off the hook forever. And so ours was, as you know, in Hacienda Heights. You had a little few slides up in LA County, uh, March the 30th. And if you read up on it, it's in a backyard, more or less. And it's a self-grafted tree. It's a lemon uh, onto which a pomelo was grafted. And it's the pomelo that's positive. And nobody's fessing up as to where the budwood for the pomelo came from. Um, the family are Asian. And if I was a speculating man, I would tell them, I used to teach my students years ago on this, and what I used to say is, 
Asian people will go home, they'll see grandma's uh, citrus in the backyard, the tree that they loved when they were kids, and so they take a bit of budwood home and they bud it up in Southern California, and that's, that's all she wrote. So I'm not saying that's what happened in this case, but as right now, we don't know where the pomelo uh, budwood came from that was grafted on to the, to the lemon. Uh, so as I said, it's absent in Australia and the Mediterranean countries. Different names in different parts of the world. In Taiwan, even in the 1800s, it was known as likubin. That obviously is a Chinese word. In, in South Africa, greening, as I've already mentioned and, and uh, explained. Uh, mottle leaf in Philippines, and that's relating to the symptoms on the leaves. Dieback in India, which actually leads to the point that as a general plant pathologist now talking, rather than uh, the specifics of this disease, one of the things we teach in plant pathology is not too many plant diseases kill plants. Plant diseases cause havoc in ag production agriculture, but not too many diseases outright kill plants. This one does, so it's in the category of worst case scenario. It will kill uh, orange trees. Um, and that leads to words called diseases like dieback in, in India. And in, in Indonesia, it's called vein phloem degeneration. For Again, it's what I'm talking about. It's the, the veins that are uh, carrying the bacterial load. And so you see veins standing out, things like that. Question. Question. You know, a, a common cleaning habit is to keep a 10% solution of Clorox in the jar and dip your pruners in when you move from one tree to the next. Yes. Now, is that effective against the spread of something like this or not? Um, no, because if you, you wouldn't be able to transmit it this way if you tried, probably. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. it, would, it will take the insect. But I mean, any, any budwood that is already infected, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But I think using a cutting knife, if you're slashed infected and slashed healthy, nobody has yet shown that that's a way to transmit this Thank disease. You very much. Uh, so that does what moves it around. You already know. I know most of you already know. The natural vectors are psyllids. And the demonstration that that was true was uh, from work done in the 1950s and 1960s, again, in, in China, um, where they showed definitively that um, it wasn't just soil in this field or weather in this part of the country. It was definitely a disease and it was definitely being spread from tree to tree by, by psyllid. <coughs> now, it turns out there are two. Uh, one's called trio Triosa erythrae, and, and eri so Eritrea. That's where it was first found in Africa. And so this is the African disease complex. It's not the one we have. At least we don't think it's the one we have. And the African disease complex uh, transmitted by Trioisa erythrea is, uh, we refer to it as heat sensitive. So, for example, in South Africa, whilst they have a lot of citrus production in the low belt, none of that has the greening that South Africa has, which is the form I'm discussing now. The greening in South Africa is all in higher uh, elevation citrus production areas. Um, and this, their form of the disease needs to be in the slightly more clement conditions. Once it gets really hot, the trees don't have it. Um, the Asian disease complex, however, uh, has no such uh, bother, it doesn't bother it one little bit. And it, it's perfectly heat tolerant. And it's the form they have in Brazil. And it's the form they have in Florida and Mexico. And we presume it's now the form that we have here in uh, the USA. And since we're associated with Diophorina citri, the other, the other psyllid, that's the, that's the psyllid that we have here, then it's all, I don't think we have to, oh, expression old professor used to tell me, he says, if you hear the sound of hooves behind you when you turn around, you're not gonna see zebras. <laughs> and I think that's the case here. That this, is, this is the one we have. Um, but uh, biologically, uh, there's not that much separation because if you do the experiments, it turns out that this psyllid will transmit this bacterium and this psyllid will transmit this bacterium. So it's, it's more to do with geography and evolution that have caused these two separations. And then as far as the epidemiology goes, and I've already touched on it, we've already had questions about it, um, 
but a specific, and this is a specific from 20 odd years ago. In India, at that time, an experiment was done, and they planted out what they believed to be uh, disease-free trees uh, in an area that was heavily infected in adjacent groves and uh, an abundance of the diaphorina uh, to spread the disease. They planted out a clean block, if you like, a clean grove amongst all of that. And in five years, 67% of the trees were symptomatic. Um, so that's an indication of the, when you have that very high disease pressure where everything around you is infected and there's an abundance of the, the vector, the psyllid, um, after five years, you're going to have 67% of your trees showing symptoms. And since it takes two years to show symptoms, the rest are probably already infected, but not showing symptoms. So we're chasing a shadow, and that was basically what the questions were. Let me finish my thought, and I'll get to your questions. So the chasing the shadow aspect is what we've already, I've already spoken about. We've already had some questions from the floor. The problem is what I've just described, that if you know your tests don't work, work very well on uh, non-symptomatic plants, then whilst you're probably going to try suppression and tree eradication, you're chasing a shadow because a lot of the trees that are not showing symptoms are probably already infected and they're in that two-year window before they show symptoms, and they should be going as well. But it's always hard to, to talk a grower into removing healthy, healthy looking trees. He'll, he'll let you take out infected trees with clear <coughs> symptoms, but he's not so happy about taking out non-infected trees. And yet those non-infected trees are definitely going to be, well, many of them are going to be potential uh, carriers of the pathogen and a source of the pathogen for other uh, non-infected trees. So uh, that's how I say it, it's chasing shadows. Now there was a question. How long will the bacteria survive in the buds that have been removed from the tree? As long as the bud stays alive. <coughs> Is that an answer? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so the Citrus Research Board is another agency in our state that's been very aggressive and very proactive in this lead-up period. Um, the lead-up period in California, I'm, I'm describing years, certainly since we got the psyllid, you know, four or five years back. The, the Citrus Research Board has been very aggressive at having educational programs and stuff on their website. This is right off of their website. If you want to know about the disease, you'll find it all there on the Citrus Research Board's website. And uh, that's just the, their, their homepage. Uh, but you can link away to your heart's content to things about the insect and the disease and what to look for and so on and so forth. So that's a resource for information, the Citrus Research Board's website. So I'm going to bring you to Thailand now. Uh, a very close friend of mine is called Chet Roystacker. His name is at the end of this long quote. Um, he's been a citrus pathologist uh, invited to so many countries in the world for such a long career. He's at the heart of any, anything and everything that's going on in citrus diseases throughout the world. He knows his stuff. And in 1993, he was asked to uh, go to Thai, Thailand for a consultancy to give their Federal Department of Agriculture some advice on what to do about this here disease, this Hong Long Bing. And he would not seen it in Thailand when he got there, and he was just devastated, personally, by what he saw, as well as the crops being devastated by the pathogen. So this is what he wrote at that time in 1994 when he wrote his report. In my lifetime of involvement with citrus virus and virus-like diseases, Never have I witnessed such severe destruction of citrus as seen in this 1993 consultancy visit through Thailand. This destruction of citrus by the greening disease has been ongoing in Thailand for over 30 years and has been well documented by others. I observe that over a period of destruction by the greening disease, the trees become unproductive and unprofitable after five to eight years. A person who had preceded him, Dr. Schwartz, had been there uh, earlier in that 30-year period, and Dr. Schwartz wrote, and Chet quoted him in his, uh, in his uh, consultancy report. Uh, so this is, a, this is a quote from earlier. Trees are not usually killed, but I'm not so sure that's true today. <laughs> Trees are not usually killed, but decline to a point where growers uproot them when costs of production exceed returns. So 
just some of the factoids about that. So 1960 was the first report in Thailand. Um, in areas where the disease was really severe, like that situation I described where they did the experiment in India, uh, once symptoms were visible, it will be, in many cases, trees will be dead after two years after first showing symptoms. And in Thailand during that period, each year, 10 to 15% of tangerine trees died each year. And in and one production region of Thailand, the northern region, they just quit. They just quit growing citrus altogether. Um, in Thailand, they, they, they didn't help themselves. They had a, they have a, does anybody know what mark cutting is? I'm not totally clear what mark cutting is. It's air layering as a form of uh, propagation. But anyway, the disease was propagated by in, nur nurseries propagating infected material and distributing um, infected material. So the pathogen distributed itself around Thailand very quickly, not by the insect, but by the nursery industry. And then the insect filled in all the gaps. Um, and so there's a lesson there, of course. That's why Thailand's up here as a lesson of what not to do. And so the, the nursery uh, helped in its spread. The nursery industry helped in the spread. And then in this report, Chet produced this graph. Um, well, he didn't. He, he, he reproduced this graph from a study done by a guy called Gronsbach. And it, it's a simple graph, and it's a graph that any, any production agriculturist understands immediately, uh, particularly a tree fruit production agriculturist, that this is your profit or loss. And so below zero, you're making a loss. And for the first three years of a citrus grove in Thailand, you're making a loss because you've got no production, but you've got costs of production, so you're making a loss. Around the fourth year, you start to make a profit because you've got some fruit to harvest. And in the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth year, these, these are actual numbers. This is not just made up. This is averaging values from Thailand's industry. Uh, in the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth year, you're making profit, but then the disease gets you. The disease takes you out. And in the last two years, 11th or 12th year, you're trying to hang on. Um, you think you might be able to recover or something like that, maybe put some more nitrogen on or something. And uh, in the end, you're, you're back to making a loss on your growth, so you're rooted out. And so when the disease is as bad as that, when, where and when Hong Long Bing is rampant, Citrus production becomes an eight to year, eight to twelve year cycle, and that's why you have uh, tight planting distances because there's no point in planting far apart. The trees are never going to get that big. So, what are they saying in Florida? You obviously all know that Florida's had it for a couple of years now. So, here's some quotes and, and statements coming out of Florida that I found in preparing for this talk. And uh, I know all the people that I've quoted. So Jim Graham, he's a citrus uh, pathologist, an extension pathologist in, in, in the University of Florida and the state of Florida. He says, by last year, um, this, was, this was last year, it was last year, more than 43% of Florida citrus trees are infected. I didn't realize it was that high, to be honest. But there it is, 43% of Florida citrus trees are infected with HLB. And the rate is climbing so steeply, says Jim, that he expects it to double in the next year or two. The first time I said double each year, well if it doubles each year we're going to get to 160% uh, in two years. But so, so, so what he's saying is, and he's, here he is again, it won't be long before Florida is 100% infected, says Graham. He, he said, and he said that HLB in Florida already has doubled the cost of growing citrus in Florida. And, these are the experts. This guy is an expert down there in Florida. He's not just making that up. He's not just saying it off the top of his head. He knows what he's talking about. Another well-renowned citrus citriculturalist in Florida is Pete Timmer, now retired. Um, a couple of years ago, he was called a pessimist when he published an article two years ago on the future of the state citrus industry. He predicted, among other things, that genetically enhanced citrus trees, GM trees, which I'm going to talk about, resistant to HLB would be widely available in 20 years. But by then, there would only be a few small citrus growers left in the business, in Florida. And then Eric Murkov, 
uh, who I'm also going to tell you a little bit more about. He has a quote, a uh, very recent quote, because he's making some progress in the genetically mod modified resistance. He, he, he says, some of these growers in Florida, they say, if you can't have something for me in five years, if you tell me it's going to take eight years, we're dead. That's, so that's Eric's quote from the, from the industry. So what is the disease progression in Florida? So this is the estimated percent of trees infected with, the, with HLB in Florida. And this is 2006 when it all started. 2007, 2008, they got one to three percent. Maybe it's not that bad, huh? See, they'd be thinking. And then a year later, you're up to 10%. A year later, you're up to 20%. A year later, you're up to 43%, the number I just quoted on the, on the, on the text slide before. Now, these are plants with symptoms. So we're back, we're back to our cycle. All the 50% the of the plants, suppose there's a grow there with 43% incidence, or well, the other trees are not healthy. <laughs> They're just not symptomatic. And so, with this kind of statistic, uh, Graham is right. If Florida's at, with this kind of a curve behind you in your interpretation, if they're at 43% now, they're really at 100% now, or close to. So, how do we manage this? Both the disease and the seed that transmits it. Well, you must start with clean stock. So, some of you will know the California nursery industry. We can't have it out in the open anymore. It's got to be under screen. The whole California nursery industry will have to be under screen. Otherwise, all the nursery stock will just get infected by the civets. So think on that. Florida's already gone that route. So that would be a huge change for the California industry. Uh, you can try suppression, which means removing symptomatic trees. I never use the word eradication. I only use the word suppression. Eradication's got a big capital E in front of it. Uh, that's what we're engaging in those programs, the suppression programs. So we can try removing symptomatic trees to reduce the inoculant potential question. Is the tip of the branches, are they affected? Yes, that's why it's called yellow shoot disease. I mean, it's the well, young so shoots. Everything's affected. Yeah, the whole tree, is, once it's infected, the whole tree is infected. There is a little bit of sectoring. You, you, you see, I've seen this, I've seen this in South Africa. You'll see trees that surprisingly, whole limbs are expressing symptoms. Uh, one, of the, one of the major limbs on that same tree will be expressing no symptoms. Which again, is another indication that you're not dealing with something like a zinc deficiency. Um, so, suppression of the psyllids, likewise, um, is going to be tried, for sure, because it's done everywhere where this disease is present, both chemically and biologically, with uh, biological control. With us. I saw you had a slide up already in the, in the pre, 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 preamble, uh, showing some of the wasps and things that might be parasitic on psyllids. Um, that'll have, we'll, we'll put a lot of money and a lot of effort into uh, both chemical and biological control of the psyllid in California now. Uh, Attention to backyard trees. Again, again, we've had the questions from the floor already. Um, backyard trees are going to be sources of inoculum for the industry. And with this disease, I can actually imagine where the state and the state regulators will start banning citrus in backyard trees in backyards that are close to commercial production. I can see that on the horizon, which is not good news for you guys. But I can see banning citrus in backyards. In, in our future, uh, if if it takes off, you know, if we're really seeing it take off, which we don't know, that's going to happen. So, but all these things I've listed for managing, they're all expensive. They all require a lot of regulation. They all require total buy-in by federal, state, and county agencies, nurseries, and growers. And that kind of total commitment, I'm going to tell you, and I've been at the heart of this was tried but never fully accomplished for citrus tristasia suppression. We got cold feet on citrus tristasia suppression in this state. So I know how hard it is to get all the players 100% committed to doing the right thing. With that behind us, of the kind of management techniques we can try and apply to an aggressive and spreading disease, with no genetic resistance available in the, in, the, in, the, in the varieties that we grow, 
your last hope is with the breeders and the geneticists that are going to produce for you resistant new varieties. And that is probably going to require this genetic engineering, genetic modification. And so what I've said in my slide is, in, in terms of management and concerns, there's going to have to ultimately be a willingness to accept genetically modified new varieties. And that's not a given. Uh, with a much, and, and a consequence of, um, for the industry, a much narrower range of varieties and, and citrus types in the industry. Because you can't do this work on every single variety and every single type. You're going to have to choose which you're going to do the work for. And the work itself might lead to the selection, because the ones that did work will be the ones that will be resistant. And the ones that you tried that had failed, they'll still be susceptible. Another question. Have any antibiotics had any effect on the bacteria? Um, tetracycline, it turns the tree white. Because <laughs> it, it bleaches the chloroplasts as well. And it's not practical. I've been there with, uh, with, with um, stone fruit diseases in, in Connecticut. When I worked in Connecticut, you can inject trees that are infected with bacteria, these were peach trees, with tetracycline. And, you, and like I said, that's what happens. You, you bleach the trees and you, you do knock back the population, but it, again, it's suppressive. You just knock, you knock back the bacteria. The, the month you stop administering this tetracycline, the bacteria just grow straight back. They're there. Just, they, you just suppress them to a low population in the tree. So for the cost reasons and, and, and how you go out in a whole grove and do that, it's never, it's never going to be a solution. Had a question? Yes. Since it's been in, around in China for so long, yes. have they had any luck doing genetically modified trees over there? Well, I mean, the genetically modified technology is only of the last five years. So they, like us, have only had the same period of time. They'll be working every single country, um, and I'm going to address that. Though I don't have information from China, to be honest. But I know the Chinese scientists, they'll be doing it. They'll all be doing it. But Spain, Spain have teams. Brazil have teams, Argentina have teams, Florida has teams, California has teams of scientists, uh, all working on the genetically modified approach. So I've changed the color of the background of the slide for green, because I'm hoping we're going to come back to healthy trees uh, with the genetic modification or the GM of citrus. So I'll read you a little quote um, from about three years ago or two years ago. Um, a, a panel was convened by the National Academy of Sciences to address this issue once it was clear that Florida was in trouble. And in 2010, a panel convened by our National Academy of Sciences reported that genetic engineering, their report claimed, holds the greatest hope for creating citrus trees resistant to the bacteria. So with that kind of backing from the National Academy, um, the green light is there for national funding uh, to pursue this avenue. So a few words from me on GM crops. Well, you know generally what this is, um, just for pure illustrative purposes. You've all seen those beautiful deep sea organisms, animals that fluoresce in the dark. And, and so what a genetic engineer would do would be to fish the gene out from the gastropod at 10,000 feet in the ocean and uh, isolate that gene, showing bacteria that indeed the bacteria now fluoresce just like the beast did down in the bottom of the ocean. And then they take the gene out of the bacterium and put it into a, uh, uh, a pine or a fir, and then your Christmas tree would glow in the dark, and you wouldn't need fairy lights. So that's a fairy tale. But as a fairy tale, it illustrates the kind of thinking that goes into the genetically modified scientists' um, uh, programs. And so, is it a fairy tale in citrus? Is anybody doing any of this in citrus? And I am here to report that yes, a lot of people are doing a lot. And I'm, in the next slide, I'm going to show you a long list of projects that are already funded in this area in, in internationally. And out of one of those projects, possibly the biggest, comes this report. Uh, or the, this sentence. Uh, he says that from his studies, I'm not going to say who these people are, transgenic studies have proceeded with several hundred plants containing various combinations of natural, but foreign to citrus, natural or synthetic genes. These are genes you just make from DNA in the lab that didn't actually come out of anything living, have been produced. 
So several hundred plants have been produced. So if you think it's not happening in citrus, it is happening in citrus. People have several hundreds of plants with transgenic genes inside them. Whether or not they're going to give any resistance to HLP is a separate matter. But the technology is up and running and people are doing it. And you can't pretend they're not doing it because they have hundreds of plants. And then he, in a separate part of his report, he states more than 875 trans transgenic plants have now been planted in the field with a collaborator. These, these would not be in the field. These several hundred plants will be in a uh, contained greenhouse facility. But 875 transgenic plants are being planted with a collaborator. This is all in Florida. These are being monitored regularly. Uh, the plant materials out in the field include sweet oranges, grapefruits, and mandarin hybrids. So I'll put these two quotes up just in case there are, what, 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 what do I say, doubt is in the audience that any of this is actually going on. It really is going on. There's a lot of activity going on uh, internationally on making transgenic citrus. And I don't have to then say about it, can it be done? Can, can you make citrus <laughs> transgenic? These quotes tell you all the answers to those uh, entry level questions. However, having said that, I would say the number of scientists truly involved, the good guys, is about 20. Uh, I don't know whether you've read Steve Jobs' biography, um, but in there it comes out very clear, Steve Jobs has this idea that if you've got a company like Apple, you only hire A people, you only B people. <laughs> because once you get B people, you get C people. <clears throat> and surprisingly, he says, A people get along better than you think they would. If you just cluster A people together, good things happen. Well, out of the 20, I'd say about five are Steve Jobs' A people. And they're not working together, they're actually competing with each other, which is not good. So, I'm going to give you Churchill's quote, never was so much owed by so many to so few. There's, there's a handful of people who are trying to save this industry right now, and this will probably be the, way, the only way to save this industry. Now, I'm not going to go through these, don't worry. No, I'm not reading all these out. But this is a list of projects uh, involved in genetically modifying citrus that is currently funded by our national program to do this. And I've also slipped in a couple of international ones from Spain that I'm aware of. I say, I'm not going to read them out, but I'm going to just give you just a quick. <laughs> Just a quickie on why I put them on the list. So first, International Citrus Genome Consortium. That's just there to say, yes, it's an international effort. These next two, Agrobacterium-mediated transformation and development of transformation systems, those are programs on the how do we do it? How do we get the genes in? Um, then this is the big one. This is the biggest and most highly funded project. It's the one that, from which I got the quotes of how many trees are already out in the field and how many plants are in the greenhouses and research labs. Uh, that's the big project. And then there's several side projects that basically have the title Engineering Citrus for Resistance to this pathogen that we're talking about. There's another one here that I've made red because I'm going to say some more about that one. And this one involves both the long-term and some short-term solutions. One of the short-term solutions is to, believe this or not, take Citrus Tristeza virus, which some of you may have encountered or know a little bit about. Um, the work to genetically modify Citrus Tristeza virus is well in, well in advance. It's well on by a professor called Dr. Dawson. He can take genes out of Citrus Tristeza virus, so it's no longer a pathogen but it does infect trees. And you can replace those genes with genes, if they're expressed in a citrus, might act against the bacterium of the greening disease. So a short-term solution will be to deliberately go out and infect all your trees with citrus tristeza virus. <laughs> a strain of citrus tristeza virus that's been disarmed, it no longer has genes to be virulent, and has been rearmed with genes that, if the genes make their products, they will probably attack the bacterium. So a short-term solution would be to repeat, to go out and deliberately infect all your trees with a modified version of Citrus Tristeza virus, also disarmed to no longer be transmissible by aphids. Question of the Yeah, has anybody thought of raising uh, bacterial resistance to it? 
Yes, all that works. I'm not going to say, I'm not an entomologist, so I tend to not read that literature. Um, I'm not, I don't mean that, but I've I read all my stuff. Uh, but yes, the, the Silic guys are all working very hard as well. As, and, and I'm going to get to that a little bit in a second. Question? Are there other plants that harbor the bacterium but without deleterious effects? Yes, some of those rotations, you, you, you asked, I think, they're, they're, the, what we call the host range. Yes, this goes to ver virtually all rutaceae, but some of ornamental or botanical rutaceae are, are not symptomless, but they don't, they don't get a severe disease. I, I can't give you lists. I, I can't do that. Um, so I'll pass on this. Is there any side effect to people eating the fruit? No, other than you wouldn't want to eat the fruit because it's bitter. Yeah. So, should we mess with the psyllid, which was the, sort of the question asked from the floor? Well, I'm going to go to somewhere else, and it, and it, and it points out um, the way science just helps, helps each other. And actually, I'm indebted to my colleague and friend who's in the audience, who's Jones, David Jones, who's sitting there in the, in the, dog's, the dog's pew over there. Um, David sent me uh, um, uh, something from, I guess it was the Telegraph, was it David? From the, week, from the, from the uh, online Daily Telegraph newspaper from England. He said, have you, have you seen this, Alan? And what it was, it's the world's first genetically modified crop, it's wheat, that has been deliberately engineered to emit a repellent against insect pests. And it's now growing in a small patch of land in the Hertfordshire countryside. He means a research plot. Um, scientists have created the whiffy wheat in an attempt to combat aphids that can cause upwards of, this is just aphid as a pest, not as a, not as a transmitter of diseases, causing upwards of 120 million pounds of damage each year to the UK's most important cereal crop, which has an annual value of $1.2 billion. It was actually from the newspaper called The Independent. Um, so what's going on here? Well, the genetically modified wheat contains an added gene, he's this word again, it's a synthetic gene, uh, that causes the plant to exude an insect pheromone. I'm sure you've all heard of pheromones. Uh, and on its leaves. And this pheromone is the one that aphids make themselves when they're frightened to warn all the others to stay away. <laughs> so the plant is admitting, emitting something that says to aphids, stay away, don't come here, it's not good. Well, there's a good solution, that's good, that's good. And so, you know, there's our little psyllid on, this gives you, I put this in to give you the scale. There's the psyllid and you can see what, is, you all know what citrus leaves look like, that's how little it is. So we don't even want him to land. We want him to get near that citrus leaf and say, I'm, I'm coming here, this is not nice. So Eric Murkoff, that's Eric, and he learned from his mentor professor to wear Hawaiian shirts. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Eric, one of my former graduate students. He, he's a professor at Texas A&M, and he's, he has moved, what he has done is moved a pair of bacterial fighting proteins out of spinach uh, into citrus trees. And the disease, the, the, the one long thing, hasn't faced this defense before, the, the one from spinach. And intensive green out testing so far indicates that genetically enhanced trees are immune to HLB. Okay, I have a question. question. Okay, you hear that Europeans have a real problem with genetically modified foods, but shall we be blunt and say the Brits are a bit more advanced accepting genetically modified food then? No, the Brits are very much against it. Okay. Very much against it. They would never accept this at the present time. We in, we in America are the most accepting of genetically modified crops. And that's because the agricultural lobby got in years ago and said, thou shalt not label anything as genetically modified. So when you, when you pick up uh, any produce from the supermarket, there's no big skull and bones label on there that said, now in Europe there is. In Europe there is. Any product on the shelf that contains genetically modified crops has a little label on it. So you can instantly see that is a, that has contained. And I'm not, I'm not gonna, what I always say about it, the little sign sure ain't a smiley face. Okay. It, it ain't the skull and crossbones, but it ain't a smiley face either. There, Question. Uh, is it fair to ask you if you have a position on <laughs> gen genetically modified um, cereal? <laughs> you could think that, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> yes, I do. And I, 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 well, it's, it, my simple answer is it's a risk-benefit analysis. And so here's illustrated what Eric's been up to in his lab in Texas. Um, 
He has seven genes, they're called defensins, it doesn't matter what they're called, that he's identified in spinach, that in spinach are definitely involved in spinach's defense against attack by pathogens. Four of these, when isolated and placed in bacteria uh, that can tolerate them, produce the protein, and when that protein is allowed to be exposed to three serious fungal pathogens, uh, Fusarium, um, Rhizoctonia, and I forget what that one is. But these are three bacterial pathogens. Uh, they can't tolerate these proteins. They, they will die, these three bacteria, bacterial plant pathogens. So there's the illustration. You get the gene out of, out of, uh, out of spinach, and you stick it into oranges. And as I say, I could give you the whole lecture on how it's done, but it's irrelevant because I've already told you how much has already been done. So you don't need to know how it's done because it's obviously there are plenty of techniques to do it. So what's Eric used? Well, he's used, he's, used, he's in Texas, remember? So he's used Rio red grapefruits, ruby red grapefruits. He's done a Hamlin sweet orange. He's done a Mars sweet orange. He's done a Valencia and he's done three rootstocks. And in all of those root stocks, he's got at least one or two of those spinach genes expressed in those, in those um, varieties and types. <laughs> but I know how much effort he's gone to do that short list. And so I return to a comment I've already made is, how hard would this be to keep this up for all the varieties that we grow and all the types of citrus that we grow? It's a tall order. I need to press on, but I'm nearly finished. So here's his experiment. And I'll cut it short. These two sticks, these two, uh, this is rootstock, and this is a cyan grafted on the top of the rootstock. And the cyan is either not carrying the gene, these, these proteins, or it, it is carrying the gene. I've got it the wrong way around. Yes. And so what happens is when you, no, it's the other way around. But anyway, the bottom line is these guys are growing out even though they were infected with, initially infected with the bacterium. But they can't grow anymore because of the protein that's been produced from the transgenic plants. Whereas the non-transgenic plants are not producing the protein and so the bud with the bacterium in it is just dying. So it's working, it's, it's actually working. Um, so who knows? So here's my thoughts. This is my second to last slide, I'm five minutes over. Um, so where are we? <coughs> so one long thing is present. And I should say, this is the official name of the disease. I know it'd be a lot easier to call it green, but the citrus, industry worldwide, the citrus research community worldwide, has formally sort of taken a vote and the official name for the disease is Hong Rong Bing. Bing. So while present, it's not yet established in California. This, this initial report in Hacienda Heights is not the same thing as the diseases established in California. We'll have to wait and see whether this is the introduction that leads to its establishment. But having said that, I think it really is just a question of now or later. Uh, that it will eventually become established in California. Uh, we've already seen from my illustrations that Florida will and is already taking a heavy loss, and the citrus industry will not survive there as we know it, or as they know it. Um, new genetically modified resistant lines of citrus hold promise, but not for many years. It's not gonna happen in the next two years. In the meantime, uh, Industry-wide, you have to have aggressive suppression. You have to have insect management. There are some nutritional approaches that will help a little bit. And trouble with all of these things is they all increase the cost of production dramatically. As I've repeatedly said, uh, increased density is likely if this thing takes off and if the disease becomes a eight to 10 to 12 year cycle when you have to then rip out the grove. Now there's two things about that. The high density itself demands much bigger nursery industry than we have now, because the nursery industry now has to produce a lot more trees for the high density planting. 
And the second thing is, if you rip it out every 10 years, then the nursery industry not only has to double its efforts, it has to quadruple or whatever. So the nursery industry is going to be under massive pressure if this thing ever takes off to be producing the trees you need to plant your grove and the trees you need to replace your grove 10 years later. Well, that's a, that's a formula for disaster because the nursery, as you saw in Thailand, was the major, major reason why their industry got so, so terribly uh, impacted by this disease. Once the nurseries <coughs> are not doing the best job they can do, and now I've just described immense pressure on the nursery industry to produce trees, that's not a good, that's not a good situation. But then California's excellent clean stock nursery program, and we certainly do have an excellent clean stock nursery program, certified disease-free trees. It's going to be even have to be more heavily regulated than it is today in this scenario that I described, um, when many dead trees have to be replaced every eight years. And as I commented earlier, I envisage in a situation like this, if it ever gets as bad as, as, as the sky is falling, um, I can't see where backyard citrus will be tolerated in the state of California if we have a citrus industry. Question, I'm finished. <laughs> Do we have but there's a, a question. possible situation where a similar bacteria would get into our avocado groves? Um, yes, the, I, I don't know of an avocado disease like this worldwide, so it's quite different. I mean, there's nothing surprising here. You know, this disease is such a well-known disease in other parts of the world there was only a question of time before it would come to California. What you just asked about avocado, there is no disease of that kind uh, ravaging avocado in the rest of the world just waiting to come to California. So it's a different scenario. <laughs>